season, there is a huge difference between the 53.4 and the 67.7, close to 68%. Now, basketball is not only uh, twos and threes, it's also free throws. And um, let's see this example for true shooting percentage. True shooting percentage is a metric that will calculate how many points you score from twos and threes and how many you get from the free throws. And this example is going to be very, very um, significant. Clint Capella, 63.7% from the field. Unbelievable number. James Harden, 43.6. 20% difference. Everybody would say, oh, James Harden takes too many shots. He's not a winner. Uh, this and that. But if you adjust the game of James Harden with his threes and his free throws, Look at the difference. There is a more than 20% points turnaround. So, which number is true? This number or this number? And the truth is in the second number. Because the second number, true scoring percentage, um, calculates the fact that the players shoot not only from the field, shoot also from the free throw. And when they shoot from the field, twos and threes, threes have better value. Kawhi Leonard example. At that game that you saw that Kawhi Leonard scored 25 points and uh, won the game from ESPN, a very credible ESPN, his effective field goal percentage was 50%. And Paul George might score a little bit less, but look how effective is the field goal percentage of his. And this is the league average. So Kawhi Leonard, just because he scored 25 points, got in the first page, he got all the attention of the world, and he's shooting less than the league average at that particular game. So that makes you thinking. Usage percentage. This is another metric that we like to see. Usage, it's an estimation of the percentage of the offenses that the player is using while on the floor. Um, that's the, uh, the, the, it's a big, it's a big um, equation that is available online. You don't need to memorize it. You just need to know that the metric exists. And this is some practical examples to understand how efficient players help the team win. And this is the top five in usage. The top five players is how many, how much percentage of their offense they're using while on the floor. So Yanis basically he gets 37, close to 40 percent of the offenses that uh, that his team is running when he's on the floor. He's taken, it's taken by him. His effective field goal is number 17 in the NBA. That brought backs with the, bo the best record. Harden, very close to him. 53rd, Rockets 7th. Doncic, very close. Mavericks below. So you see that as they drop in efficiency, they drop in ranking. And look at Young. Young and Bradley Beal, and you see that their efficiency is lower than the rest of the other guys. And look at the ranking of Hawks and Wizards. They're one of the, they're some of the worst teams, but these guys, since they're playing and they're having the ball in their hands, they got selected to be the all-star, and this is the unfairness of the system when you're not looking at the advanced metrics as is effective field goal percentage. Um, this you have to keep in your mind, and this is, if it's something that you need to get out of this lecture, is that stats can lie, but usually stats lie when you don't know what you're looking at. So if you're looking at field goal percentage, well, most likely you're going to be wrong. If you're looking at effective field goal, if you're looking at true scoring percentage, then most likely you will have it right. And now, we talked about the players. Let's talk a little bit about the team. Um, Bucks, they score 119.1 points per game, and Mavericks 116.4. Which one is the better offense? Well, 
The answer to that, what would be? I don't know. I don't know which one is the better offense. You cannot compare how many points one team is scoring against the other team because these are not comparable. These are not comparable metrics. In order to do that, in order to be able to compare this type of metrics, we need to have the term of possession. When you, because we don't know how many chances Mavericks had to score these points, how many chances uh, the backs had to score these points. We don't know. This is a this is this is a lie. If we say that this one or the other one is better, it's a speculation. Possession is this. You come from this part of the court to this part of the court, and that's one possession. While you can stay on this part of the floor, you can shoot, take the offensive rebound, kick it out, shoot again. That's still the same possession. You might have two shots, you might have two plays, as we said, but this is the offense, this is the possession. And um, how we calculate the possession is by this formula. We add the field goals, free throws attempted times 044. This is the number that they found that is um, free throws that terminate the possessions. We add the turnovers because turnovers terminate the possession, and we take out the offensive rebounds, because the offensive rebounds um, keep the possession being the same. So if we want to find out what's the possession, it's very simple calculation. Everybody can do it. You can do it on the bench. You can do it live. You can do it any with, a, with your cell phones. It's very, very simple to calculate, to estimate, how many possessions are at a game? I have a question. Yes, please. Uh, sorry. Uh, you put there, or uh, I have two questions actually. 0 0.44, how you calculate and what it means? Why you okay. use it on the formula? There's been, there's been a big research uh, getting data from uh, 10 years in the NBA. They counted every free throw, because as you know, free throws can be one, like an end one. Uh, it can be two free throws after a shooting foul, after a bonus foul, or it can be three free throws. So we don't really know how many, um, what's the number of the free throws that finish the possession. So after they made this research, they figured out that if you calculate 0 0.44, it's a coefficient, if you calculate this, with the number of the free throws, you will see how many free throws end the possession. This is an estimation. This is data from the NBA. There's been efforts to make it new with data from EuroLeague. This is a project that we uh, do in Newstats with cooperation with uh, the university. So um, we'll soon find out if this coefficient exists still. But right now, everybody works with this coefficient, this 0.44. This is what you uh, have to calculate, the, have to um, multiply the free throws yes. with. And is there any other formula that you believe before that formula? Uh, because there are a couple formula to calculate for the position as well. So a couple uh, of this... other formulas. These other formulas, what they do, they calc they um, they have uh, regressions equations. I don't want to bother you too much with uh, technical um, okay. uh, technical things. So it's coefficient from regressions that are made, studies are made in the, in the American basketball. There is okay. nothing that is the same with, uh, that he has done, uh, work has been done in European data. So uh, because we don't know, we don't know if this data is true, we're not using, and we're using the most simple form, which is this form that uh, we showed you right now. Okay, thank you. No problem. So, if we go back to our example and see how many points each team is scoring per 100 possession, this is the offensive rating. So, if we do that, we find out that the Mavericks score 117.0. This is points per 100 possession. So, if the game was played for 100 possessions, Mavericks would have scored 117. The Bucks 
would have scored 113. So despite the fact that the Bucks actually scored more points than the Mavericks, the Mavericks has a more efficient offense. So the answer to our questions is the Mavericks. The Mavericks have a better and more efficient offense than Milwaukee because they score more per possession than the Bucks do. And this is how we make a metric, a variable. That's how we make it comparable. Other examples. New Orleans. New Orleans, they're fourth in points scored but they are 15th in offensive rating. And this is why we need the analytics. This is why when you go and structure your game and you play against a certain team and you say, okay, this team scores 116 points. I look at the ranks. They're fourth in the league. They have great offense. If you don't look at the offensive rating, if you don't calculate the offensive rating, you will not have the whole truth. This team that you overestimate that's been fourth Actually, it's 15th. Actually, it's in the middle of the pack. And it can be vice versa. You can have a very average team in terms of scoring and can be a very, very highly efficient team. So you need to know the offensive rating. You need to know the analytics before you make any type of decisions. Defensive rating, same procedure for defense. Bucks and Magic, they have the same... Um, pretty much uh, points. They receive the same points. Somebody might say that, you know what? They're similar. They have, they have similar uh, differences. Well, it's not. Because Bucks defensive rating, Bucks receive in 100 possessions, 101 points. While the Magic, 108.7. So that means Bucks have the best, offense in the, the best defense in the NBA. Magic, ninth. So you, you get the feeling, you get, you get the feeling of what I want to say. Don't look at the numbers itself. It's deceiving. You need to have the analytics behind it. The same goes for every metric. metric. For example, rebounding. The defensive rebound percentage and the offensive rebound percentage is different. So... When we're talking about the defensive rebounds, we say, okay, this team is averaging, I don't know how many, 20 defensive rebounds. The other team is averaging 15 and so on. But you don't know how many chances there are for rebounds. And this is this formula, what this formula tells us. The defensive rebound over defensive rebound plus the opponent's offensive rebounds. So how many rebounds were in a basket and how many of them did we take back for defense and for offense? The expected average is teams need to have uh, around 73% uh, for defensive rebound and around 27% for offensive rebound. That's the expected average that you might have for a team. Let's look at the examples. New Orleans, they take 11.1 offensive rebound. They're second in the league. But when you do the percentage, they're seventh. And they get 22.9. Now, assisted possessions versus assists. And this is an example where last year um, I was a big, uh, I'm a big fan of uh, FS uh, basketball because in this part, FS was the best team in EuroLeague last year. It's not the actual assist that matters, but the percentage of baskets that comes off assists. Golden State Warriors, they're 12th in the assists they make. But they're, ba they're number two in percentage. So uh, this is a very important metric. Do not stay on one number. Um, some of you might have heard like a first stop of like a first um, place of uh, analytics, the four factors. Well, the four factors, uh, just to make it simple for you to, uh, to have it, is nothing, it's nothing simple, it's nothing uh, strange, it's nothing complicated. It's um, the answer to the question that Dean Oliver gave to the world, how do teams win the game? And win teams win the game by making shots, by um, avoiding to turn the ball over, by going to the offensive rebound, and that's all three 
his possessions and by score, going to the basket. So by putting together these four metrics gave an idea of what a team is doing in terms of uh, how they handle the, te- the, the possession, how they score the possession, and if they lose it. So effective field goal, turnover percentage, offensive rebound percentage, and the free throw rate. This is an example of the free throw of the four factors. That's from EuroLeague. That's from uh, our work in uh, new stats. And this is um, a random team. 60% is the best team in EuroLeague. 16.2%. It's one of the bottom teams in EuroLeague. 30% offensive rebounds. And 11th in the free throw rate. Free throw rate basically shows how many points you get when you go to the basket, when you go to the, to the, to the line, uh, according to the possessions that you play. Now, when we go and we scout a game, um, what do we need in terms of analytics? We've seen all this. We have to start with offensive rating, defensive rating, this type of ratings to be in a percentage. And now, um, look at the opponent statistics. The team's defense starts according to the home court, home or away, according to the result, wins or losses, according to the shape, three or five recent games, and we have the sprintouts like this, so you can all play with that. And this is before we go to the play-by-play statistics. This is an example of how play-by-play statistics is kept in EuroLeague. Now, play-by-play statistics is the future, and this is something that um, we all should be comfortable with using because this is the best source of analytics that we can find and will help us uh, to our decisions more than anything else. Play-by-play statistics, I can't stress it enough. Um, I will give you an idea of what they are and how to use them, but please go on, search about it. This is a great great feature to have knowledge of. The first, play, the first play-by-play statistics that we like to see is what we call on-off statistics. On-off statistics will give you two things. One, what the team was doing while this specific player, Anthony Randolph, was on the court and what the team was doing when Anthony Randolph was off the court. So when we see right now, if we see right now, the offensive rating, when Anthony Randolph was on the court, his team was averaging 10 more points in the offensive rating than when he was off off the floor. floor. So that means that this guy helped the team play good offense, helped his teammates play good offense. And this is something that we need to know when we go for a player. On the other hand, look at this, defensive rating. He wasn't that efficient when he was on the floor in the defensive end for his team. But overall, if we count this, he's a plus. In the 24 minutes, 23.7 23.7 minutes that he played in the 47 possessions that he played Real Madrid was consistently winning the opponents because they were, they were playing better offense and their defense was not as bad so Anthony Randolph you understand how important player he is because when he plays it doesn't matter what he does while he's on the floor It doesn't really matter. It's not about his personal um, contribution. The team plays better with him on the floor. And that's what you need to know. The same way that you can evaluate a player, you can evaluate a team of five players, a lineup. And now, this is the best lineup of Real Madrid. Campasso at the one, Rudy at the two, Taylor at the three, Randolph at the four, Tavares at the five. This is the offensive rating they had, and look how great of a difference they played. 89.5 points per 100 possession. 
they were average in offensive field goal, and this is the four factors. If you go into more details, and you can have more details, and I'll show you around um, in our website, you will find a combination of players. Everybody says, I'm sure that you've said it, oh, um, these guys don't play well with each other. And I would use a, a, an example of, uh, which is not true, actually. Uh, some might say, oh, uh, Mitic cannot play together with Larkin, or Larkin is not playing together with Dunstan very well. That's a way to find out how teams of players of two, three, and four play together on the court. See now, Sergio Yule, when he plays with Tompkins, his team is averaging 5.5 points over the opponent. They're winning more. They're winning their opponent by 5.5 points. An unbelievable amount of offensive rating. Their offense between Yule and Tompkins is great. Of course, the games are not that many. But if you take out, uh, for example, Edith Tavares and Sergio Yule, they're not playing that many, that many minutes together. And their offense is not that great. For some strange reason, some might say that Tavares and Yule doesn't make the offense of Real play better. Actually, it is worse 7.3 points per 100 possession than when they not play together. And that's why they only play seven minutes in the game. So things, winning teams, there are secrets of the chemistry and the way that they use players. And uh, if you really look for it in the statistics, if you, look, you really look for it in the analytics, it's there. It's there for you to see. So if somebody might say, might ask, oh, why not Yul is not playing together with Tavares? Yul is a great player, Tavares is a great player. Why they don't play good together? You know what? They don't play good together because of this. And that's why they only play seven minutes. And Tavares is playing more with Campaso because the team is playing better. The team is, is functioning better, as we can see from here. Now, let's say, let's assume that we have the information, right? Um, now we have to need to show it. So um, the visualization of the information will cost you, will save you a lot of very precious time. And I will show you examples of how the statistics of spacing, timing, and efficiency can be put together in, um, uh, in a map, can be visualized, so you can do, see it right away. This is the special statistics Special statistics of Golden State Warriors in the season 18-19. Now, if you look at this, you will see the accuracy. How accurate they were in comparison to the average of the NBA. And this is, the blue, is how bad they were in comparison to the average of the NBA. And we can see that this area of threes, this area of mid-range was working very well for them. So right away, when you look at the heat map, if I was to play against uh, the, the Golden State Warriors and I wanted to shed a little bit out of their percentage or get them a little bit out of the comfort zone, right away, what would I do? I would force them on this side of the court. I would try to force them on this side of the court. I would try to keep them out of the corners, try to minimize as much as I can their, uh, their impact inside the arch, inside the, inside the, the paint and force them to this side. Top of the key threes, in between areas, in this side. This, by just looking at, the, at one image, will help me understand if it's the best side or the bad side. So when they go down, all the left pull-ups, all the left turnouts, all, this, all these places, it's very, very dangerous. So I would probably do something to lead them the other way. The same way, this is Vasilis Panoulis' visualization. You see, everybody knows, okay, if, if everybody doesn't know, I will tell you that he likes the right pull-up. He loves the right pull-up. 
and you can see it right here. He loves top of the key shots. He likes right pull-ups. He never goes to the corners. And he is average in the in-between area. So he likes right pull-ups and right drives, as we see from this, from this color. And um, so when you, when you see a heat map like this, and this is a lot of games, and you can uh, uh, experiment with the situation, then you know what to do. You don't want to force Panolis to the right. You don't, want to, you don't want him to go to the right because he's extremely dangerous. You want to take him out of his comfort zone, make him far left, force him to the corner, keep him in these areas, force him to take shots from in between where he doesn't like to take shots and where probably he's not as successful. But if he gets in the pain and if he goes for the right drive, you know what? Most chances are that he's going to be successful and you're going to be end up ending up with some problems guarding him. Another thing, another thing I'm sure, I'm sure that you've heard, uh, it's a saying that everybody has in the team. You come a player comes to you and you tell him something, or why don't you shoot like this? Why don't you are more aggressive? And they come to you and they say, um, you know what, coach? The ball guy won't, you won't give me the ball. He won't pass me the ball. And you're thinking and you're kind of worrying and you're saying, well, is, he, is it true? Is it not true? And this, this statistic right here will show you if this is true or not. Because you see the stats of Clay Thompson and you can see the stats of anybody who just pick a selection of NBA and you see who passed him and for what type of stats. So corner threes of Clay Thompson came mostly from Kevin Durant, Draymond Green, Steph Curry, and very, very limited from Andre Godala. If you see the lines, I don't know if it's that obvious in your computer or not. So you know who is passing to whom. If um, Clay Thompson says that Kevin Durant doesn't pass me the ball, well, he'd be a liar because Kevin Durant passed him the ball for a short two, for a long two, for a corner three. Kevin Durant has passed him the ball. So um, the same as Draymond Green. See the big, big line of passes leaving from Draymond Green's uh, part going to Clay Thompson's part. So you know who is passing to whom. And this is also very important to see. The point guard, the decision, the distributors, the passers in this team was Kevin Durant and Draymond Green. Something that you might have as a feeling, something that you might experience from your past, something that you... Uh, here talking on the internet or in, in uh, coffee houses or in places where fans get together, that this guy is not passing to what or whatever, or this guy is not playing well with each other. We see that with analytics, we have this information. We have it. It's there. The same. For a league, you see out of which position, which one is the best player. Best player for finishing under the basket, Giannis. You can have the same for a team. You can have the same for a team. You're playing against FS. Who is good from this area? Who is good from that area? Who is good from under the basket? And how does this compare to the average? They might be good, but they might be good being below average. So um, this is the thing that you need to, uh, to be aware of. It exists. It's out there. It's not something uh, crazy. Now, look at this. This is um, LeBron James. LeBron James, how he shoots from the ball. How he shoots the ball. He shoots the ball under the basket, 63%. He takes top of the key threes, 31%. Sometimes he goes to the corner, 37% from this side. So if we play against LeBron, take him out of the paint. Take him out of the pain. Force him right. Force him to this area. Force him, keep him on the top. Make him shoot the top of the key three. Contest him. Force him to the corners. And this is where he passes the ball. So this guy gets 25 points per game and 27 points per game comes via assist. 
he passes for a lay for a for a layup and he passes for a corner three so every time we see a penetration of lebron james and we want to cut off his side his his passing what we need to be aware of he's passing for a layup he's passing in this corner more than anything else so somebody who's up there come back and help because he's not going to stop and pass back to him these little details will help you have a better game plan will help you have an advantage for a game plan over your opponent because you know you you, you don't imagine you don't think that uh, something you know strange might happen no no you know that the lebron james when he penetrates or when he's inside or when he wants to pass he's not going to stop and pass back to him never he will go on and find the corner he will go on and find the big man take that away from him help some with some other ways and i'm using lebron it could be any player now um another thing that we can uh, we can have is um we can have a report for a player um and we can uh, compare him to the league we can see how stable he is uh, doing that, if somebody is uh, familiar with statistics or simple statistics, I don't want to be bothering you with technicalities. There is a um, there is a meaning of standard deviation, which means how much um, his average deviates left and right. For example, uh, a very simple example could be if somebody has a 10 points average and um, he is usually shooting either 10 points or 12 points is a more stable player than somebody who is uh, 10 points average, but one time he might be scoring 19 and the other one, the other time he might be scoring one. So this is stability and instability and we can have it and we can present it um, in a way that he can be compared with other players in uh, his position. Now, this I like the most. This I really like the most because this is visualization of playing time. And I'm sure that with one second, you can understand how Real Madrid started the games and how Real Madrid finished the games. That's from two years ago, the data. Randolph, he started every single game. He's a player that played this minute is the first quarter, second, third, and fourth. He played all the times, dark blue color in the first quarter. He played all the times in the third quarter, and he might be in the game for the last couple of minutes. Same with Yule, first and third. Same with Kozer, first and third. Same with Taylor, first and third. Same with Tavares, first, third, and a little bit fourth. And now, who closed the games for Real Madrid? Who were the closers of Real Madrid that was very, very important? Campasso, second and fourth. Rudy, second and fourth, sorry, Trey Tompkins, second and fourth, and maybe a little bit Ayon, maybe a little bit Tavares, the other ones were interchangeable. So three of the players, three of the players were key players for, for Real Madrid that were in the game in the last minute. Maybe Jesse Carroll too, which is never started the game, played a little bit in the second, and when he did to, he played more in the fourth than in the other quarter. So by looking at one minute, you don't need more than that. You need one minute and you understand the rotation and the chemistry of Real Madrid. Guys, this is something that uh, a few years ago we didn't never had. And this is something that we couldn't have had if we didn't have play-by-play -play statistics. Everything that we've shown so far is coming from play-by-play -play statistics. And this is why it's very, very important to know and to, um, to have. The same way, we're not talking about game time, we're talking about scoring. And this is how Real Madrid is scoring. Andor Rinaldo scores the first quarter, scores the third quarter, maybe a little bit at the, at the end. Jules scored, this is from a different season, Jules scored in the end, Campasso scored in the end. Again, we see how important Campasso is for this team of Real Madrid. This is actually from this year. The previous one was from the uh, two years ago. Another thing that we have, this is a league. This is a work that we did. Uh, 
Just sorry. The, yes. the previous uh, table. This, this one. Is five minutes interval, right? And total. This is um, five minutes interval. Yes. This is no. every box is five minutes. So let's say Anthony Randall. At, so at the first five minutes of uh, how many games? Fifty points. Like let's say. This is uh, ten season, games. The first ten games. Ten games. First ten games. First five minutes. He scored fifty total points. Yes, exactly. Okay. Exactly. Thanks for the clarification. I went a little bit sooner than this. And um, this is from the World Cup, and you see the teams in terms of the offensive rating, the defensive rating, the pace, assist percentage. Assist to turnover, effective field goal, turnover percentage, offensive and defensive rebound percentage, and free throw rate. So right now you see at the, at the top 11 teams on the World Championship. And um, just by seconds, you see exactly which ones were the better teams. Real Madrid had a very good, uh, sorry, Real Madrid. Spanish team had an excellent defense. Um, Serbia had a very good offense, but the defense was not that great. Uh, the, the American team, it was pretty average on both ends. Maybe a little bit better defense. That's why they didn't have good results and, uh, and so on. And um, I would also like to show you just a couple of things that we have new in, um, in new stats. And um, when we look at uh you still watch my uh, screen right at um yes. Fenerbahce, we see all these things that we discussed about four factors we see the roster we see the games we see the heat map points scored and minutes played and everything everything is in there we see the on off statistics for every single player we see the lineups and everything that comes with them. And with the click of a button, if you click this button, immediately you get this report. This report will show you the roster. We'll show you the last results. We'll show you um, how uh, the team is reacting on uh, offensive in on four factors how they compare with uh, the opponents in traditional stats and advanced stats, how they are scoring, the heat map, and how each player ranks with the competition. So you can have this with a click, just uh, have some key elements uh, if you don't want to create um, your own uh, reports like this, or you can have a table like this, and it shows you with green color the players immediately that stand in each category. For example, um, you know the seven shots that Jan Vessel is taking is uh, way above the average of the league, but uh, his free throws, 51%, is way below the average of the league. So you know um, uh, what to expect in terms of uh, who is overperforming and who is underperforming uh, in the same. So um, that would be that be all from uh, from my side. Um, I, if you have any questions to ask, I'll be uh, happy to uh, to answer. Um, the whole question is this, though. Say, try to look for the right way to say the truth. The numbers have always the solution uh, for us. And um, if you stay with traditional numbers, sometimes you might be wrong. You might be overestimating the value, the value of points, and you might underestimating the value of efficiency. And um, what made um, FS uh, great the last couple of seasons in, uh, in EuroLeague, if you study their, um, their stats, is that FS was not a fancy team. They were not a team that uh, they had great games, but they were not a fancy team. They were a very, very efficient team.
team, a very effective team in most of statistical categories. And this is what made them, uh, gave them the wins. This is what gave them the advantage. The fact that they were very, very efficient. So um, that's all for me. If you want to have any questions, I'll be glad to answer and I will stop sharing my screen so I get a chance to see you guys. Hi coach, this is Ahmed. Uh, thanks for joining us. Uh, I have two questions. Uh, one of them, uh, is that a full account or uh, just basic account of that site, new stats? Um, no, you can uh, you can have it as a as a no. We have as a basic some things, and uh, full account is uh, more things. And we are working on uh, customizing. Uh, yeah. If you have any offers or if you have any questions that you want to be customized, or you want to see like whatever you want to see, we can uh, we can provide. Yes, yes. Okay. Uh, I I was asking about your sources feeds and uh, where do you get this this stats, but I think there is an answer. Uh, like that. Uh, my second question is: um, I think uh, reading stats is uh, more important. Analyzing them. Uh, what kind of mindset do you have when you analyze a game or player? Uh, what are your priorities? Great uh, question. Because Great question. There, I will answer there, you that. There are lots of combined stats to analyze. That that was my question. Thank you very much. When? Great question. Thank you very much. What we analyze? What we do this? In everything that we um, that we do, there is a so-called bet. You know, there is two two percentages. That one is is never 50-50. One is 60%. The other one might be 40. The one is 70%. The other one might be 30. So we try every time when we make a, a selection to base our selection on data and um, go with what is less percentage every time. So if we see a heat map and we see that this player is great on the right side and he's shooting, for example, 60%, and from the left side, he's shooting 30%, then we're going to force him left. We're going to keep on forcing him left. If he, we, if he beat us, he will beat us by having to make something great, something way more than his average. So every time what we do, we try to find the percentages and we take the higher and we leave the other, the slow percentage to our opponent. And we do this in every aspect of the game. Wherever we have to make a, a dilemma, whenever we have to choose between those two scenarios, we calculate the percentage for one scenario and the percentage of the other scenario, and we keep the high one. This is uh, the action for all tactics. This is how we play pick and roll defense. A team is playing, for example, um, has a very low... 30% um, in between game and they have a great uh, three point game 40% maybe more we're not going to go heads out on them we're going to go flat and we're going to let them shoot in between game because they make with 30 and we win with the, next, with the other 70 if you know what I'm saying so everything every decision that we made is based on statistics and it's based on us having the most percentage of the other team. Okay, thank you. Thank you, coach. No problem. I have a question, coach. Yes. Uh, for line of statistics. Yes. Uh, for example, the, uh, the example you showed, especially uh, when you pair two players, not five player lineup but two players yes. is there a way uh, to subtract the playing time uh, that wasn't so important in the result of the game yes say, you can you can do this 20 minutes 20 point game last six seven seconds that i don't want to see this yes you uh you can sort by criteria you can create uh uh, the criteria that you want to see. They say, for example, I want to see close games. I yes. want to see yes. Yes. last five yes. minutes with this type of difference. You can create this type of sorted and you will find this, uh, this type of statistics. It's not available online yet, but it's, it's happening. It's, it will be happening for our side. And that's what I mean. But this is, is a way is to... Is again possible with... Um, uh, 
step by step. Uh, uh, what was it? I forgot. Play by play. Play by play. Play by play. Is it? Yes. Possible? Everything is play by play. Everything is play by play. We can make this. We can make the criteria that we want. We can select a filter, for example, and we say we want to see all away games that finish with difference of uh, five points. Mm -hmm. And we can see the combinations there. So we take away all the garbage time because yes. this is very, very important what you said. Garbage time can alter the results. And uh, you might think that the uh, guy is super scorer and he scored it when the game was 15 points difference or 10 points difference. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So maybe, yes, play maybe, by play. Only play by play can do this. Maybe two young guys who play five exactly. games per game could end up the best player in the team because of this garbage time. And if you want, you can take away you can take away the young guys. You can take away these guys of the garbage time. You just throw them out of all because they can change the statistics. Exactly. Thank you. Thank you, coach. Başka sorusu olan var mı? Coach, I have two questions. Uh, one of them. How you, as an assistant coach, how you convince uh, the player to use those stats and to affect their performance during the game? And how you convince the, the head coach as well? Because, you know, they have many things in their shoulder. Uh, sometimes they may say, okay, uh, you did a good job, but uh, there are some more chemistry things that I have to end, uh, handle. So convince is a more important art for you guys uh, who read the stats. So how do exactly. you convince how do you convince the players and how do you convince the head coach to use okay. the effect of the uh, stats? I I pretty much use the same way for players and for coaches. It's very important that both of them are part of the plan that you have in your mind. Both play if players don't support it it's not going to work. Whatever coach, even if the head coach supports it, if the players don't support it, it's not going to work. And I tell them this. I tell them, okay, if this guy, if you let this guy shoot the three-point shot, this is a 60% chance that he will make it. If you force him in the paint, this is a 40% chance that he will make it. So it's up to you. What do you want to do? If you want to listen to me, if you want to listen to what I'm saying, this guy will go and you will shoot a low percentage shot. If you don't listen to what I'm saying, this guy will go and shoot a very high percentage shot. Numbers is something that players very easily understand. They will not understand something very difficult, but if you tell them, okay, if you do this, this is 20, and if this happens, this is 80, then they're not stupid. They will go for the 20. So in every chance, because all kids right now, you know, all the all the players, they are uh, looking at percentages, looking at their numbers. They are um, some of them even looking to, for betting. Everybody knows about percentages. It's very, it's something very simple to tell them that this is a high percentage solution. This is a low percentage solution. You take the choice. I'm not going to take the choice for you. I'm going to tell you that this and this and you choose and if you tell them this then most likely they will choose the right uh, the right questions i always try to make the players um co-workers we are together with this we try to uh, make it solve the problem together and i will give you the intelligence and you are the soldiers who are going to make it happen i've never had a problem with uh, with a player because of uh, of this issue, never. Okay, thank you. Yakup, onu tercüme edebilir misin? Ben e, İngilizcem de sorayım mı? <gülüyor> Mikrofonun açık değil. İlk kısmını anlayamadım hocam. İlk o money ball kısmını. There is a question resource, but we we are trying to translate it. Okay. Uh, Hmm. You know, these uh, baseball teams use stats also 
NBA teams of course. also use stats, of course. GMs especially the front office especially to uh, form uh, compose the roster. Mm -hmm. uh, is it also possible to do it in Europe just by using stats numbers to make the correct lineup, correct roster? Yes, yes, there is a way to do it. Um, the first, the first people who started using statistics is for decision making was baseball many years ago. You've all seen Moneyball, the movie, yes. and uh, how it works. Basketball started about 2010, 2012, making this type of decisions. Mm -hmm. And um, yes, in Europe we can make this. We can make this type of uh, solutions. We can uh, figure out, uh, for example, if a player is coming from a league in Finland. Uh, we can predict how they can perform if they play in Euroleague. Mm -hmm. We could predict how uh, we'll give you, we're not going to give you exact number of he will score 12 points, but we'll give you that this guy has a 70, 80% chance of him becoming a key player in the Euroleague team. Or he, this guy has a 20% chance of becoming a key player in the team. So there are solutions. Uh, there are many techniques and now we're trying, we're working a lot with uh, new stats, with uh, machine learning and uh, artificial intelligence. Mm -hmm. uh, so we have a lot of uh, these options trying to predict the performance of a player in the future uh, for a league, for a different team, for there's a lot of things that can be done in this direction. And the basis for everything, the basis for everything is the, the ability to manipulate play-by-play -play statistics. If we have the raw data of the play-by-play, -play, we can work miracles everything can happen and imagine that the nba teams they have maybe uh, the spurs from what i know they have 15 people working full time as the department of analytics so it's a lot of work and um, in europe you know that we have to be a little more resourceful because no teams have the money and they don't have the resources for this but uh, there's a lot of uh, room for prediction uh, according to the data that uh, a team has so so you say, let's say as a Euroleague team, I want my guard duo, two point guards, who will share 40 minutes. Maybe they will play together sometimes. So total they will play 45, 50 minutes. And I want these guys to make total 12 assists every game. Mm -hmm. So I am searching. I will select one player from Euro Cup and I select one another player from Champions League. So by checking their stats and using some metrics, so I can predict their performance next season in Euroleague. Is it, so you say this is this will be possible? Yes, and this is a combination. Uh, right now, to this to, today, this lecture, it was about uh, quantitative statistics. Yes. Quantity, how many? Yes. Now we can have the same analysis for quality. We all have synergy. If we have worked with synergy, we know pick and roll passer and all these things, yeah. what they have. So we can combine qualitative and quantitative and we can give an estimation. It's an estimation mm -hmm. uh, of his performance in the future in a higher level. So there can be an estimation. So if we have like two players, as we say, Euro Cup and one Champions League, we can uh, combine... Um, their quantitative and qualitative data and from this we can project their career in the future maybe no nobody's going to be 100 percent ready yeah. but we can tell you that this guy has a 80 percent chance to make it this yes. guy has a 6 percent chance to make it okay thank you thank you very much one more question can we use stats uh, live stats during the game uh, to give feedbacks to coach in game decision making yes this is this is a this is an area that nba teams are working a lot mm -hmm. uh, trying to predict uh, the next play try to predict uh, who's going to take the next play and how to predict how the game is going to be um, it all depends on the set of data that you have if you have quick data that comes in live uh, then there is uh, chances that you can uh, go on and you can manipulate these things uh, it takes a lot of uh, computing power from computers and most of them system works with uh, artificial uh, intelligence and uh, machine learning a lot. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. It's the same way, similar way to how the betting companies uh, calculate uh, live, the score. Live bets, live bets. Live bets, exactly. Mm -hmm. It's the same, the same, uh, the same quality. There is a model, and the model gets fed with data, and the mo this model evolves during time, and this is mm -hmm. how this uh, this works. Ahmet hocam, yeterli oldu mu cevap? Bu Bayisle Bayisle benzer e, şeyle yapılabilir diyor. Bayis şirketleri gibi. Thank you, thank you very much, coach. Teşekkürler. Başka sorusu olan var mı? Ee, yok gibi. Ee, okay, coach. Uh, it was a very uh, interesting and uh, uh, uh, good presentation. Thank you for your time and thank you, thank you for sharing your thoughts and uh, knowledge. Thank uh, you very much. Thank you, Jakub, that uh, for you and you bring Coach Christos to us and uh, meet with us. Thank you. It is a great pleasure for us. Coach, uh, we always give the last word to our guest. You can close the uh, live uh, webinar. This is your turn. Okay. Thank you very much for coming to us. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much for the invitation. It was great uh, seeing uh, some faces that some of them uh, are my friends and uh, I'm very honored to be here with you. And um, there's a lot of people saying that uh, basketball is not uh, numbers, uh, that players uh, are human beings, and uh, it's not easy to predict uh, human behavior and all these things. I agree with that, but uh, I will close uh, my, uh, my webinar with one thing. Um, just remember, score is a number. Anything that has to do with numbers can be predicted can be worked upon uh, and can be um, manipulated. So score is just a number. Although players are playing, are human. This is great, coach. coach. Thank you. Thank you very much. Enjoy. Thank you. Bye. Good Bye. luck. Bye. Bye. Have a happy day. See you. Bye. Bye. Teşekkürler, Yakup. İyi akşamlar. İyi akşamlar.